Welcome to Brainstorming America. I had like to mess up there. Welcome to Brainstorming America. I'm Ken Rollins. I'm here with John Merrill. Good to see you, John. Thank you, Ken. Hey. That jacket. I like that jacket. Thank you. Last time I wore it was at the I Kentucky was Derby. Say, I saw you That's at right. Louisville, Kentucky. That's right. And you stood out. You just didn't have one in a hat. No, I didn't have on a hat. No. Cindy had on a hat for me. She but got this jacket for me. The show we did last week, you had a red jacket on. That's right. That's Alabama, because I've seen you That's right. at Alabama again. That's my crimson jacket. It's yeah. the Alabama jacket. What do you do there? Do you? Uh, I've seen you up in the booth a lot of times. Well, it depends on what they need me to do on a okay. particular day. But I, you clean uh, up guy? Yeah. Well, whatever. Whatever it takes in order to be effective and to play my role. I wanted to ask you, though, I, uh, for the folks out there, we got some Alabama fans out there. Uh, what What is your thoughts? Because ain't nobody knows Alabama football any more than John Merrill. What do you think about this new coach and this his crew? Have you met him? No, or? he's going to do a great job. I haven't met Coach DeBoer. He's been very successful everywhere he's ever been. He was successful as a player. He's been as successful as his stops as head coach wherever he's been. And now at the university, he'll have better resources. He'll have better players. He'll have more money. He'll have uh, better coaching. He'll have all the things that he needs in order to be effective. And he's won at the highest level everywhere he's ever been. So I anticipate he'll do the same thing at the University of Alabama. And mark my words, if we beat Georgia when we play them on the 28th of September at Bryant Denny Stadium, then we will go undefeated in the rest of the regular season and then enter the playoffs undefeated. Y'all heard that now. That's, I, I agree with you. This is a uh, roll tide. <laughs> roll, roll, roll tide. But we we had here at TV24 had uh, Coach Saban up here to speak, and uh, I have to say he, he I wasn't a Saban fan per se. I liked his coaching, but it, him as a person, I didn't like him or dislike him. But after that night, Jeff was you there? Yes. Uh, Jeff is shaking his head yes. For you folks who can't see him, uh, he spoke about the way he does his football. And some of the young fellows come walking in there, they're slouching, and he made them, he, they didn't even want to shake his hand. He made them shake, he got up and walked back around and made him shake his hand. But he, he talked to them a lot about character. He told them what a day is like it. He said, if you got good disciplinary, you got good knowledge in football, you're a good person, and you got good uh, academics. You can play football for Alabama, but if you're missing one of those, you can't play for me. You can't not love the Lord. You can't not do your schoolwork, and you cannot practice when it's time to practice. He said, "You got to do all that for me." He said, "At seven thirty in the morning, you're gonna be out to do this." But he went through all the things. I was so. So impressed, but he said something that that he said when you come through the door, leave all your baggage outside. Come in through that door, ready to talk about and listen to what we're talking. About. Leave it out there. I went to my next state board of veterans affairs meeting, and I was the vice chairman. I said, I "Want all you VFWs, America leading guys." Leave all your baggage at the door. We're going to talk about Alabama veterans. I didn't tell him that that was Coach Saban's stuff, but I stole his stuff. But I, I respected the man. And then we had the guy, Les Miles. You know him? Yes, he was the head coach at LSU. He come in following him, and all he did was talk about how he beat the system, telling all these young football players how he got around this, jokingly, telling them all the things, all the stuff he played the games he played on the teachers and got away with doing things. You know, he, I said, oh, what a, what a contrast between sure. these two. But, but Saban was, uh, learned me a lot. He learned me a lot. Well, let me tell you something. He's learned a lot of people, a lot of different things. He's the greatest to ever do it. And you look at the wins and the losses that he's had, uh, but really you look at the success he's had in developing young men. Before he went to the University of Alabama, Alabama had never had a Heisman Trophy winner, and he's had four. And he had four in the last 
14 years. It's just remarkable to think about the kind of difference and the kind of impact that he's made everywhere he's been as a coach and as a leader of men. And that's why the legacy that Nick Saban leaves, not only as the head football coach at the University of Alabama or at the Miami Dolphins or at Louisiana State University or at Michigan State University, he's one of the greatest coaches to ever do it. And we're all better off for having lived during this time and witnessed it. He's still down there doing it. Yes, he he's is. He's still down there doing, uh, still working on his legacy, that's I right. think. But he's, uh, he's doing stuff for these young men. He, he was more than a coach about the game. He was coaching them through life. That's right. That's one of the things I uh, picked up on what he's done. You know, what do you do? They had him, they had my kids over to his house with him and his wife. And they talked to him about things in life. Well, what, what are you having a problem with? The guy borrowed some money and couldn't pay it back. You know, those are things. He dealt with people like that. You don't need to do this. You're paying interest on when you borrow money. You're paying 18 to 20 percent interest when you. This is what he was telling he does. And he talks to young men like you're my son. And that's not what I see other football coaches doing. So I, he got my admiration. With this one minute we got, I want to. Uh, recently, you had a piece on social media about. Uh, about voting, you know, you know what I'm talking about. It was a long one. Yes, sir. I know you couldn't cover it in a minute, but yes, sir. You want to address that? Well, the main thing that I was talking about is the concern that you should have about the secret ballot and about maintaining your secret ballot when you go to the polls and making sure that you're the only person that knows who you voted for. And with the technology that's capable today, and it has been used in other states in the union, it's possible for people to determine who you actually voted for and who your spouse voted for, who your children voted for. That kind of information can be used against you. And so what we want to do is just to preserve the integrity of the vote and the integrity of the elections process. We appreciate you joining us again this week for the 70th episode of Brainstorm in America. We'll be back with you right after this first break. Welcome back to Brainstorm America. Ken Rollins here with John Merrill. John, have you ever been to Santa Monica, California, by the way? Been to Santa Monica. What do you think about that? I place? think it's beautiful. It is. And been to Santa Monica, Santa Barbara, mm -hmm. uh, Pasadena. A lot of those places, Kim, we went to beautiful. back in January I and watched, late December watched, for yeah. the Rose Bowl. I kept up with you, but I mean, I used to live in Ventura, and uh, Santa Monica was a place where you just wanted to go and be, everything was all, all flowers to the trees, to the beaches, to the, to the parks. Now, well, you know, sometimes the Santa Monica Freeway can make a country girl blue. <laughs> well, we'd write a song about that. I forget That'd to be you. great, brother. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we would go to Santa Monica as a treat to, for the family type thing, just to go and look and all. Now, you can't stand to get near the place. The, the parks are just so loaded with needles and so many vagrants in the parks that nobody wants to walk amongst them. It's just, uh, they just stole Santa Monica and turned it into a ruined place. And I saw, uh, uh, what's the guy, the, the governor, uh, New, Newsom, Newsom, uh, out there picking up trash under a bridge the other day. And I thought, wow. Too late, buddy. I mean, you know, he had his gloves on, and of course he had a big cameraman, camera crew around him while he's doing that. So uh, it, it's really a sad thing. I was thinking if Santa Monica ever goes, I've done seen San Francisco go to hell. I've done seen all the other, the Santa Barbara's you're talking about. Still got relatives who live out there. It's, it's an embarrassment to see I was looking at Ventura the other day, and that used to be the most enjoyable, peaceful place that you could ever want to be. No more, no more. That old place has gotten there. It's really sad, Ken, but it all comes down to leadership, and that's the thing that needs to be remembered, especially this year when you're getting ready to cast your votes for our leaders at the national, at the state, at the local level. 
you've got to make sure that you elect people you've got confidence in. You've got to make sure that you elect people that you know can do the job. You need to elect people with proven track records if they're offering their self for public service and they have a history of public service. You need to make sure that you're supporting people that you have confidence in are going to give you the kind of service that you expect from them in those elected roles. We've seen individuals that have been able to come in and transform cities and transform communities and transform states because of their leadership. And if you have the wrong people in those roles, then you're also going to reap the benefit of that in a negative way. And so let's make sure that we choose wisely as we move forward this fall. Absolutely. It's, uh, uh, an example of that is I'm reading one of my notes here that today there is uh, the, the deal was hundreds of businesses in Minneapolis are still closed. There's just, some of them have just been raised. The building's been torn down. They left none but concrete. Hundreds. It didn't say how many, but. How many years has that been? Two or three years? That was four years ago. Four years. It was in the COVID year, gotcha. in the summer of 2020. Another thing, we couldn't go within six feet of people during them days. But you notice on those, unless you're protesting, they were all up in each other's face. I mean, what's, what's going on there? Wasn't that kind of hypocritical? It was very hypocritical, especially when they would allow people to come together in those protest formats, but then not to assemble for church services each and every Sunday or each and every Saturday or every day, depending on what your faith is and what you would like to do as far as you're expressing your faith in a religious format in the church or religious institution of your choosing. And whenever that occurred, those people were being penalized and they were being persecuted because they were trying to demonstrate their faith whereas the people that were protesting the people that were coming together with uh, rocks and hammers and other instruments to do damage were destroying public and private property and were not even being identified for prosecution and the governor of the state refused to call in help from the national guard during that time yes sir and uh then there's another time where he said they would have to be DIE type people. The National Guard would be, he don't want any National Guard in there that are, have white supremacy type thing, that kind of, uh, that was, he allowed his state and he allowed the city to be demolition, demolished to uh, appease some groups. And that's where Kamala gave money, bail those people out. Yeah, that was in that Minneapolis thing. I don't know how many people out there still remember. You can't let these people do this stuff because if somebody tells you what kind of person they are, listen to them. They've told you, they showed you. So if somebody's showing you what they are, believe them. They really, they're out there and they're asking for your vote. And that's when I was on this Waltz thing because this guy from Stolen Valor to all the things he's doing, uh, who's to say he's not going to continue doing the same stuff? And he's going to be influencing Kamala. Because no doubt. And we hope you'll influence others and you'll continue to do what you're doing by watching us after this break as we bring back the final segment of this week's 70th episode of Brainstorm in America. Welcome back to Brainstorm America. Ken Rollins here with John Merrill. And John, I want to go to another subject if we could. Uh, you used to be the Secretary of State. You know all about voting everywhere. I, I remember you were the you were the president of the Secretary of State for the United States. Yes, sir. So this is a voting I saw in the paper where Virginia had purged their voting list and it come up with over 6,000 illegals on that one purge 
does Alabama do there? Absolutely, and it's something that we have to do all the time. We're required by law to do that every four years whenever the presidential election is over. In January and February of 2025, the purge will occur and these names will be removed. You know, one of the things I took a lot of pride in when I was a secretary was talking about our efforts to ensure that each and every eligible U.S. citizen that's a resident of Alabama would have the opportunity to become a registered voter and obtain a photo ID. From January the 19th, 2015 to January the 16th, 2023, we registered 2,215,229 new voters. When I left office, we had 3,702,689 registered voters in the state of Alabama. But during that time, we removed more than 1.3 million people from the voter rolls. It's a daily event, a daily activity that has to occur from the 201 registrars in the 67 counties throughout the great state of Alabama. And when people are talking about, well, we removed 6,000 here, we removed 3,000 there. Well, we removed 1.3 million people during that time. And it's something that you have to be diligent about doing each and every day. And you remove those people because they moved away, because they passed away, or because they were put away and they lost their right to vote. But also, if there are people who are processed by our registrars and added to the voter rolls, people who are illegal, who should not be there, those people need to be removed immediately. But if the registrar actually follows the procedures that are established, then those people who are ineligible to be on the voting rolls should never be added in the first place. But if they are, they need to be removed immediately. But voter roll maintenance is the number one priority with a successful administration of the election. Well, I was wondering when I saw that, how does somebody who is illegal get on the registered well, as a voter? Well, it can happen in different ways in different states, and so you have to be careful about following the established procedures and checking off each item as you're supposed to do it, so that way you know that you're following your established state laws. Mm. Each state has different laws related to voter registration, voter participation. Well, I saw uh, something on Facebook, a woman, I think she was in Atlanta, had found something in the parking lot, and it was the, a stub, a ticket, from a uh, EBT card, welfare, whatever you want to call that, where they food stamps and whatever. She had a remaining balance of five hundred and thirteen dollars mm. on that a remaining balance in the middle of the month, and she had five hundred dollars in cash that she could get at her discretion. This is a illegal. This is a person that she saw in line that could not speak English, that was going through the line and somebody had to interpret for her. But yet she had dropped her paper showing how much money she had. And she said, here I am, I got three kids and I'm all I can do, we're going through the rain of noodles and whatever to feed my kids and she's got all this money that comes in here that they get. And then I saw, some of these people have uh, Social Security. Now, how does that work? I don't know how, how, how those work? people are added to the roles that are ineligible, but people that are not eligible to receive benefits should not be receiving benefits, and if they're identified as receiving benefits, they need to be evaluated, assessed, they need to be investigated if it's warranted, they need to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law so they can either pay back those benefits they received or pay back through serving time in the penitentiary. You think that's going to happen? <laughs> well, it depends on yeah. whether or not you've got encouraged and enthusiastic prosecutors. Yeah. Well, uh, I saw I saw about Walt, so it seemed like I'm piling on him. But this other thing, you know, he said he went to war because he used the AK, talking about weapons that we have, rifles and things we have in America, and they always go with AR-15. And he said, we're going to do away with the weapons that I carried during the war to state that he carried in war. First of all, he'd never been in war. 
think about that, folks, when you say, when somebody says, I was in war, that doesn't mean that they went to Iraq and was a cook. That meant they was in war. So know what they're talking about when they say that and hold them to that. And uh, the, the back to the voting thing, uh, citizens to vote, the, the voter ID has caught hell over the years. I know you're an, uh, not an opponent of it, but you are a supporter of it. Absolutely. Of, I helped uh, sponsor the legislation and then was the first secretary to implement it. I still see that it's catching a bad, bad uh, thing. Uh, so they making it racist. It's racist. How does that, how do they connect that dot? Well, I think one of the things that's interesting is Vice President Harris had an event just a couple of weeks ago where she wanted people to come, but in order to gain access to the venue, you had to present your driver's license. Mm -hmm. They captured your information that was on the driver's license in order to allow you to gain access to the event for Vice President Harris, and yet she's been an outspoken critic of voter ID and using your driver's license as a method for identification. You know why she did that? Do you have any idea why she did that? There was a reason for it. Tell me your thoughts. <laughs> That's exactly why. J.D. Vance landed at the same airport she did. He went over to Air Force Two and to see her take off running. She, he was going to give her some questions as a person in the crowd, right. some questions that we've been wanting to ask. He had those questions ready. She took off running. I mean, not, not walking, right. but running like crazy. And old Bubba... Uh, well, the only time well, we want to see you running is when you're running to the TV to turn up the sound so you can listen to another episode of Brainstorming America. We'll see you back here next week. Thank you for joining us.